Commissioner Schwartz. Here. Commissioner Lodge. Here. Commissioner Larson. Here. Commissioner Jordan. Present. Commissioner Jacobs. Here. Vice Chair Jostis. Here. Chair Bartlett. Here. Okay, our first item for this year under preliminary matters will be the nomination and election of a new chair and vice chair. So I would welcome uh, nominations for chair. If we can start with that position, please. Ms. Schwartz. Great. Thank you. Sure. Let's let's do them both. I'll second. Great. We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. So we have a new chair and vice chair, and now we get to do musical chairs. So we're going to have to swap positions. Well, let's see. I'll go either way. It doesn't matter. One side of I think the I think the typical drill is for the vice chair to sit next to the chair, and then uh, the remaining seats uh, are uh, a matter of preference based upon seniority. It's worth it for this. Okay, I, uh, first off, I'd like to thank the rest of my colleagues for your uh, support in honoring me with the uh, position of chair this year. I will do my best to um, run good meetings, be flexible, and at the same time uh, get us out uh, the door in an efficient way so that we conduct our business uh, openly and fairly. Mr. Chair? Yes. I would just like to thank Mr. Bartlett for his year of chairing, even though we didn't meet frequently. You did a great job of leading all of us, and believe me, we all appreciate it. Well, it was a real honor to do it, but I'm happy to move over one seat and uh, let Commissioner Jostis chair this year. I, I weren't here when, wasn't here when you chaired, what, five years ago, so I look forward to that opportunity. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, our, our first substantive item uh, is review of the minutes and resolutions from our previous meeting, uh, the first being the draft minutes of December 16th, 2010. Are there any uh, corrections, additions, deletions, or other modifications? Um, Mr. Chair? Yes, Ms. Lodge. I, I believe there were some, but they were previously made, and I would move to approve the minutes as corrected. Is there a second? Second. second. A second by Mr. Bartlett. Um, any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. We have approved minutes for uh, December 16th. Um, the next is the uh, resolution 019-10, uh, 1032 East, Mich East Mason Street. Any changes or corrections to those? Um, the document. Hearing none, is there a motion for approval? So moved, Mr. Chair. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, Mr. Uh, Mr. Cato, is there any request for continuances, withdrawals, postponements, or addition of extra agenda items? No, there are not, and no announcements either. Thank you. Um, the next uh, is the uh, announcements okay. appeals. Uh, now let's go on to the uh, uh, public comment from members of the public on matters which are not on our agenda today. Are there any green slips or members in the audience who would like to speak to the commission for up to two minutes? Seeing, yes, sir. If you could come up, state your name, and following your comments, fill out a a little green card, so we've got it for the record. I did fill out a green card. And, uh, good afternoon, council members. 
My name is Austin McCray. I've lived in Santa Barbara for 39 years. 30 years ago, I was diagnosed with glaucoma, and I started a beta blocker renin. Uh, recently, uh, six years ago, Dr. Zelko, my ophthalmologist, told me that chemoptic doesn't and work at, at nighttime when you're asleep. And uh, so I went to alternative medicines to find out, and I found that uh, cannabis helps me in that situation. It lowers the, the, the ocular pressure at night when I'm asleep, when conventional drugs don't. Okay, Mr. Cray, are, are you speaking to the issue in front of us today in, as far as our permit goes or in a broader sense? Uh, I'm speaking on my medical condition and why it's important that the facility remain in Santa Barbara and close to my address. It is convenient. I live in San Roque area. Okay, then what I'm, what I'm going to do is ask you to wait until we hear the matter, and I'll call you back up uh, to provide your, your public testimony. What, what we're Thank trying you. to do here is kind of organize our public input so the comments that are pertaining to a particular item on our agenda are taken in the order that they appear on the agenda, and then give a much broader opening opportunity for members of the public to simply address the matter, the commission on matters that are not on our agenda. All right. Okay? Thank you. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, seeing no one else coming forward, I'll close the uh, uh, general public, public comment period, and we'll move on to our first substantive uh, item on the agenda today, and that's the appeal of uh, uh, Patrick Formey um, of a staff hearing officer's denial of the application regarding uh, 2915 De La Vina Street. Mr. Cato? Dan oh. Gullett will be giving the presentation. Okay. Uh, Mr. Bartlett, before we start with the staff presentation. Mr. Joseph, yes, I needed to announce that I will be recusing myself on this item. I own commercial property within 500 feet of the subject parcel, so I will not be able to participate. So I will see the commission at our next regular meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Daniel. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the Planning Commission. This is a, an appeal hearing for the application of um, uh, an existing medical marijuana storefront collective dispensary located at 2915 De La Vina Street. This application was reviewed by the staff hearing officer on December 15th. The staff hearing officer denied the application in consideration of the issuance criteria provided for in the marijuana dispensary ordinance and the applicant has subsequently appealed that decision. The dispensary is located on De La Vina Street near the intersection with Arden Road. This is a C2 SD2 zone lot. It's 7,500 square feet. The subject parcel is located in the upper De La Vina area. The dispensary ordinance provides for five different areas throughout the city. It limits the number of dispensaries per area to one, and it limits the number of dispensaries permitted by the ordinance to three. The subject parcel is indicated in the red uh, on this map. Uh, if the subject parcel is approved, it would be the, the third and final dispensary allowed under the ordinance. The primary for issue for staff has been conformance with issuance criterion 12 provided by the ordinance with respect to the legal nonconforming status of the dispensary. Issuance criteria 12 reads that the applicant is not engaged in unlawful, fraudulent, unfair, deceptive business acts or practices with respect to the operation of another business within the city. Although this would be permitting an existing business, and it does say operation of another business. Staff has interpreted um, the intent of this criterion uh, to for the decision makers to consider past past practices of the applicant and past behavior. Based on site visits by staff in the past, the city attorney's office has, uh, has contended that the dispensary ceased operation for a period of greater 30 days at some point 
between November 2007 and January 2009. If the dispensary did so, it uh, reopened illegally after it closed for 30 days because it lost its nonconforming status. So in correspondence, the attorney's office has asked for sufficient evidence from the applicant um, that it had continuous operation during that time period and if not is asked uh, that the dispensary discontinue operations. The applicant has provided some evidence to the attorney's office but it hasn't been to the satisfaction of the attorney's office that, that it, it was in continuous operation. So the attorney's office has continued to um, pursue this case and has sought a, a court injunction against the dispensary. Each of the three adopted medical marijuana ordinances has provided for a continuing operation of non-conforming dispensaries. For the time period in question, the two ordinances that were in effect were the interim ordinance, which allowed non-conforming dispensaries to continue operating um, to provide con continuous assistance to qualified patients, and then the ordinance that replaced the interim ordinance, the original ordinance, uh, again allowed for the non-conforming dispensaries to continue for a period of three years until, um, in, unless the use was discontinued for a period greater than 30 days. So in terms of timeline for this uh, dispensary, as indicated in the applicant submittal, it opened in April of 2006. Uh, the interim ordinance was um, in effect in August, uh, retroactive to August 2007, replaced by the original ordinance in April 2008. City Zoning Enforcement sent the applicant a letter in October 2009. That letter essentially said, submit an application um, and receive a permit in a timely manner or cease operations. The application was submitted in November 2009. After that, um, the city attorney's letter, which is included in your packet, um, stated what I stated before. Essentially, submit evidence that you've been operating or cease operations. And uh, the injunction consideration is set for trial in June of this year. Staff's secondary concern uh, expressed in the staff hearing officer staff report uh, relates to a recent burglary in conformance with uh, issuance criterion nine. And I, would, I won't read um, the entire text here, but the essence is um, that we don't believe the dispensary will adversely affect the neighborhood or result in repeated nuisance activity. So the dispensary was storing marijuana off-site at a storage facility downtown. Uh, that um, There was a burglary at that facility. There was marijuana stolen from that facility. And um, the police department and staff uh, reviewed that incident and, and believed that the applicant was negligent in how the marijuana was secured in, in that instance. Um, in response um, to that burglary, staff has uh, proposed a condition that the all marijuana provided to the dispensary by the collective be stored at the dispensary site, closing the loop between cultivation uh, and dispensing. And um, that has uh, um, satisfied staff's concern that uh, another um, burglary of this type would take place. So staff is recommending that the Planning Commission deny the appeal upholding the staff hearing officer's denial of the project, making the finding in Section 8 of the staff report. Uh, if your commission wants to consider approval of dispensary. There are draft conditions included as Exhibit B, D of the staff report, and I would recommend some changes um, to those conditions based on additional information and change plans from the um, applicant. 
Uh, condition C required that bars be placed on the outside windows or breakage sensors. The applicant has updated the security plan. It's been reviewed by the police department, and the police department is satisfied um, that it addressed staff's concern. Um, so staff would recommend that condition C be om omitted entirely. Uh, condition D relates to the operations plan revisions. And that condition doesn't have a timeline of when those activities would need to take place, and staff would recommend that those changes be made within 30 days of approval. Uh, in the text of the operation plan, it states that there are six security cameras, but um, the, the submitted uh, site security plan shows 13, and the 13 are what is supported by uh, the police department. So staff would uh, ask that that be reconciled uh, in D4. Uh, condition E refers to timing of a building permit and operations of the dispensary. The current wording says that the dispensary can't operate until it gets a building permit since the dispensary is currently operating. Um, staff recommends this language, which puts timelines on when uh, building permits would need to be obtained. And uh, the final change is condition G. There's a typo, and uh, I'd ask that the word following be omitted. Uh, and that concludes my remarks. Um, uh, Captain Armando Martel is here from the police department, and Susie Reardon, the staff hearing officer, uh, joins us as well, and we're available for questions by the commission. Thank you, Mr. Cullen. Uh, at this point in time, I'd like to offer the uh, applicant up to 15 minutes to make a presentation to the commission. Uh, following that presentation, uh, the commission is going to, if they have any questions, I'll either ask them of staff or of the applicant, and in some cases, uh, with those questions, you'll have further opportunity to uh, articulate or give more detail on it. So um, we're looking to you to try to kind of keep it concise and focused on the on the matters at hand. So with that, please state your name, and uh, we'll move forward. Good afternoon, Chairman Justice and members of the Planning Commission. I am Gilbert Gaynor, and I represent applicant Patrick Formey and the Compassion Center of Santa Barbara County. And Chairman Justice, we have a, a uh, rather thorough presentation that we anticipate will take just about 15 minutes. And then, of course, we're happy to go into detail on anything you'd like. Thank you. So in thinking about this presentation, <clears throat> Patrick and I started with a basic premise that you, the members of the Planning Commission, are here to exercise your informed judgment as to what is best for the Santa Barbara community and for the people affected by your decision. You're not six rubber stamps, nor are you here to take a myopic view of the case focusing exclusively on legal technicalities. You're not sitting as a court to decide uh, the rightness or wrongness of a legal dispute. You're here to use your best judgment to make a discretionary decision. Now, we all understand that there will be three permitted medical marijuana dispensaries in Santa Barbara. We are here to demonstrate why the oldest dispensary in Santa Barbara and the only one in the state of California to operate with registered nurses on staff should be one of those three. The Compassion Center dispensary is located a short distance from Cottage Hospital. So let's first hear from the, direct, from the Director of Clinical Care at Cottage Hospital. Uh, that's Dr. Stephen Jose, a distinguished physician, board certified, graduate of Harvard Medical School, and with 38 years of experience, most of that in more than 30 years in our community. Dr. Jose? Good morning. My name is Steve Jose, and I'm Director of Clinical Care at Santa Barbara Cottage Hospital. I'm in charge of teaching clinical medicine to the residents at Cottage Hospital. I'm an internist, and I'm board certified in infectious diseases. I'm here this morning uh, in support of the Compassion Center here in town. And I'm doing this because I first learned of the medical benefits of cannabis from my HIV patients back in the early 80s, who oftentimes would use cannabis to relieve their insomnia, their nausea, and also help them with severe weight loss that occurred as a result of their AIDS condition. Since the cannabis has been legalized in California, one of the important interfaces that my patients look for is a way to acquire medicinal cannabis and also get some advice 
about how best to use the substance. The Compassionate Center here in town, since with its employment of nurses, has more medical expertise to help them with the various decisions, including whether the cannabis should be smoked, ingested orally, or applied topically. As well, since there are nurses who are there who have expertise with regard to this, the various varieties of cannabis can be used and suggested depending on what the underlying conditions are that people have. For example, some varieties are much better for insomnia, some are better for nausea, and others are better for relieving pain conditions. The Cannabis Center is indispensable for the care of my patients here in Santa Barbara, and without it, it would be a, mean a significant loss to the community, not only as an educational resource, but also providing what is needed for my patients to relieve their pain and suffering. I support the Compassion Center of Santa Barbara County without any reservations at all. In fact, I look forward to my patients going there and getting the advice they need to obtain the medicinal cannabis that they need for their underlying medical condition. Thank you. Dr. Jose feels so strongly about the Compassion Center that he also provided a letter in which he cited the center as a model organization for a dispensary and a sworn declaration under penalty of perjury that states his position as well. <clears throat> but Dr. Jose is not the only medical doctor to come forward in support of a permit in this case. The Compassion Center, because it's the only dispensary to operate with registered nurses on staff and has a high degree of medical professionalism, has earned the support and trust of other members of the medical community. Dr. William Edelstein is a medical doctor who has practiced in Santa Barbara County for the last 28 years and works for the county health department. In his sworn declaration under penalty of perjury, he comments that uh, the Compassion Center is the most professional and efficient provider of medical cannabis in the county and states it is an invaluable resource for doctors and patients. Dr. Edelstein's view is fortified by do that of Dr. Morton Sachs. Dr. Sachs is a board-certified physician and diplomate of the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine, has over 40 years' experience. He makes clear in his declaration that the Compassion Center is highly professional with a knowledgeable, supportive staff, including registered nurses, and that denial of a permit would be a big loss to many patients. These doctors are joined in their views by Dr. David Behrman, who's another physician with over 30 years medical practice in the Santa Barbara area and an expert on pain management and cannabinoid medicine. He focusing, focuses on the fact that the Compassion Center has qualified nurses on staff and states that it's, and this is a critical point, has proven to be an excellent resource, particularly for mature patients with serious illnesses and infirmities. Dr. Behrman gives in his declaration an example of a recent patient of his, a 62-year-old woman undergoing chemotherapy for breast cancer. And she was, he tells that she was relieved to learn that there was a medical marijuana dispensary in Santa Barbara that had registered nurses on staff. These physicians are joined in their firm support of the Compassion Center by Dr. William Meller, Dr. Meller is a clinical instructor at USC, a board-certified internist who's practiced for 31 years in this community, and he points out in his declaration that the presence of experienced and informed registered nurses sets the Compassion Center apart from other local dispensaries and that it operates with a high degree of professionalism and that, in his view, the city would lose a tremendous medical asset if the center were to close because of a permit dispute. So the evidence in front of you, uh, commissioners, includes five uh, declarations of five physicians who together have over 195 years of medical experience, most of it here in Santa Barbara, and who strongly endorse the issuance of a permit because in their view as physicians, it is an asset of real value to the medical community and the patients that they as physicians serve. And then of course, there are the patients. As Dr. Behrman noted, the center is a particularly invaluable resource for more mature patients. Uh, in the supplemental declaration that we provided, we came up with an updated figure on review. The Compassion Center has more than 1,000 patients over the age of 50. Now, everyone is entitled to his or her medical privacy. And therefore, I think it's kind of sh striking that there's no shortage of patients with rather serious medical conditions 
some of them life-threatening, who are willing to come forward and go on the record and share, what, share their stories as to the importance of the Compassion Center to their lives. Eric Rasmussen is a good example. Uh, Mr. Rasmussen, who I think is here today, is a 69-year-old gentleman. He has cancer, and he's being treated by Dr. Sachs for the side effects of chemotherapy. And he states in his sworn declaration, it's very important to me to belong to a dispensary that has professional registered nurses on duty to address my medical questions. And he adds that he feels safe with the Compassion Center because of the atmosphere and the professionalism. Uh, Ms. Gay Alexander is another uh, member of the Compassion Center, and Ms. Alexander is 77 years old. She suffers from spinal stenosis and ruptured discs that cause her severe pain. And she swears that the Compassion Center's registered nurses have advised her of what works best, and they've always behaved in a professional manner, but she has never once been high, and that, quote, I need the center to alleviate my serious pain and to continue living on my own. Steve Bordeaux has also come forward to give a declaration. Mr. Bordeaux is 56 years of age. He suffers from AIDS. He also has hepatitis. And he states, the guidance of, of and attention from the registered nurses is irreplaceable, and they have medications that are not available anywhere else. He testifies that the Compassion Center is essential to his well-being. Carol Pertzalakis is 63, and she suffers from pulmonary hypertension. Hypertension. She tells us that she relies on the registered nurses for, of the Compassion Center for tinctures and medications that are unavailable anywhere else, and she says that their medicine is a lifesaver, a lifesaver that helps me lead a normal life. Donald Gus is an 81-year-old retired professor of English. And Professor Gus uh, also has spinal stenosis. He has severe shoulder pain, and he has sleep problems. He tells us that the Compassion Center is important to him because he can consult a nurse who can inform him as to his non-inhalation options, and that because of this consultation, he obtains pain relief that he cannot get from opioid medications. Uh, Mr. John Fox is 64 years old, and he suffers from chronic back pain, he, uh, as well as gout. And he makes a point that's, that's similar to Mr. Goss, that with the help of the, to of the Compassion Center and its nurses, he's able to avoid toxic, addictive drugs like Vicodin. Um, we're, we're 10 minutes, so you have five minutes okay, left. Okay, I, I think I'll make it. Great. I, I certainly hope so. Uh, Anthony Benedict Smith is 52. He suffers from chronic leg pain. It makes him unable to sleep absolute agony. He again commends the Compassion Center. Ruth Hammett is 60. She has fib fibromyalgia, rheumatoid arthritis. She tells us the nurses have been quite helpful to, uh, to her. I believe she's here today as well. Our final patient declaration is from Deborah Tracy, who's 48 years old. She has a uh, connective tissue disease that she's had from birth uh, called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. It causes excruciating pain. And she says, once again, that without this and the help of the nurses there, she would be reduced to oxycotone and morphine. Those would be her only alternatives. So these are the small, this is a small sample of the Compassion Center's patients and members who are mature individuals with serious medical conditions who, based on their doctor's recommendations, depend on the Compassion Center. Then, of course, there are the neighbors. Now, it's critical, I think, that none of the neighbors of the Compassion Center has experienced any problem or expressed a word of opposition to the Compassion Center. To the contrary, we have 101 Dental Laboratory. They have not caused any nuisance issues for us. Plaza Liquors. Plaza Liquors says not, they are good neighbors. Dr. John Craviotto and Car Craviotto Family Chiropractic. Uh, he's not experienced or even heard of any problems. Madam Taylor. Uh, they are nice and respectful, no problems. Uh, Happy Little Hippo, which is a children's clothing store. Uh, Happy Little Hippo says they've always been polite and courteous, no problems. Smart Marketing, which shares the driveway. They've been respectful and courteous, no problems. Iyengar Yoga Studio. Uh, Iyengar Yoga Studio says nothing but positive experiences, a great neighbor, civilized establishment. The very opposite of a nuisance.
The staff report, in fact, actually reflects findings that are supportive of a permit for the Compassion Center. They include the findings that the Compassion Center is consistent with California law and the municipal code, not identified with crime, no significant numbers of police calls. Issuance of a dispensary permit is appropriate, says the staff report, to meet the community's needs for, for access to medical marijuana, and it would serve the needs of city residents. We submitted a transcript of the hearing that we had before the staff hearing officer. I was not present. And at a city council committee ordinance meeting uh, on January 11th, council member House helpfully summarized the staff's statements at that prior hearing. But I was uh, noting here that the, uh, as part of their appeal to the planning commission, the transcript's been submitted, and it says from the staff, it said, but primarily we don't have a problem with how the facility's been run. There's been no complaints about it. It seems to be a professional run organization. Uh, haven't received any complaints. So we said we, we don't agree. The, the planning staff has said that the, despite all this, the, the permit should be denied, and obviously we don't agree. And we spelled out why in detail in the letters of appeal. We set forth ample evidence in the form of the declarations that uh, the Compassion Center has never, in fact, closed, that it's been in continuous operation, and that uh, the proof is ample. The ordinance the staff says the center had violated wasn't even enacted at the time the staff says the violations occurred, and they didn't occur in any event. But we also believe that a legal challenge in a court battle should not be necessary because there's every reason for you to do the right thing and grant the permit. The grant of a permit is discretionary. This is not just our view. It's also the view of City Attorney Steve Wiley, as expressed at a City Council Ordinance Committee hearing on January 11th. A new permit really is prospective. It's like you take someone and you take their application and their operational plan that required it. What we know about them, and is, is this someone who would be, should be allowed one of these permits because they are discretionarily issued permits? So your decision is discretionary. It's not dictated by a list of 12 criteria. It's not an automatic fail if you don't make one of them. It's up to you. It's your call as to what's best. There will be at least three dispensaries in Santa Barbara. The Compassion Center has been in continuous operation for 11 years. It has won the support of physicians and the trust of patients and members. It's, as Dr. Jose stated, an indispensable resource. We urge the Commission to do the right thing, issue a permit to the Compassion Center so the doctors and patients can continue to count on a highly professional medical cannabis dispensary with registered nurses on staff here in Santa Barbara. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gaynor. And thank you for setting a standard for other applicants to follow and staying exactly within your 15 minutes. Very nice job. Thank you. Okay. At this point, uh, I would like to entertain uh, questions from my fellow commissioners to either staff or the applicant. And the lights are coming on here. Uh, Ms. Schwartz, would you like to start? And then we'll just move down the, uh, the row here. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate the opportunity to go first since I need to leave at 2.45 today. And I do have a variety of questions, but for now, if I could, uh, I'd like to uh, just address a couple of my questions. And if you don't mind, Mr. Chair, perhaps come back uh, later if, that's, if it seems appropriate. Um, Mr. Formey, or I'm not sure uh, who from your team might like to address issues that I would have uh, for your business. So if you could come back up to the podium, I'd appreciate it. And thank you for the opportunity on Tuesday uh, to do a site visit at the Compassion Center. That was, I, I found that very helpful. And even though I live somewhat close by, I actually hadn't been to your site. So that, that was informative. Oh, it was our pleasure. Um, referencing Exhibit E, and I assume, I don't know if you have uh, the exact documents that we have in our package, but this lists two locations for the Compassion Center, and I'm not sure if this is current or outdated information. We have the 2915 De La Vina Street, where uh, we did our site visit, and then 119 North Milpa Street, number C. And um, so I would ask you to describe this, since for me there was some confusing and possibly conflicting information in our packet about the Milpa Street location. Uh, well, 
Let me just state, and perhaps Patrick can clarify this if, if, I, if I don't clarify it sufficiently. The Milpa Street location was a location that has been closed since approximately... 2008? 2008. And the only operation, the current operation, since April, since that date, in fact, in 2008, it has been the um, De La Vina Street location. The De La Vina Street location is the only one, and it's been in continuous operation since April 2006, as stated in the uh, declaration of Saul Levitt, the attorney for the landlord. Okay, thank you. Uh, another location I wanted to ask you about that's referenced in our package, uh, and specifically it's page 8 of the, in the letter of appeal, and that's 3532 State Street. Uh, can you tell me about what, if any, relationship the Compassion Center has with that look, has had or currently has with that sure. address? Can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay. Um, we initially had the 119 North Milpas since uh, 2000, and that was in a medical facility. Uh, and there came a point uh, when we, we had two locations uh, on both Milpas and Delavina. Then uh, we just had a single location on Delavina, and then we opened up a secondary location on State Street as well. So there was, uh, that's part and parcel of the confusion. There's been at times two different locations simultaneously for the dis dispensary. So what was the period of time, Mr. Formey, that uh, you also were operating out of 3532 State Street? Um, I don't, I'd have to look at my notes and reference banking statements and different things and, and a lease to get the exact dates, and I can come back with you that. I just don't want to state something that might be inaccurate. Okay, so I would like staff to obtain that to Mr. Cotto or Mr. Gullet, um, the earliest convenience. I'd now like to turn to um, the documentation um, that is referenced in our city attorney's office to you dated April 7th of 2010 of last year. On page two, um, there are se several types of uh, supporting evidence by way of documentation that uh, was requested, and uh, maybe Mr. if Mr. Vincent needs to comment on whether all of these are required or perhaps just a sampling of these uh, that would provide substantial evidence to the city that, in fact, you were in continuous operation uh, during the time frame that's referenced here, which is November 21st of 07 to January 9th of 2008. Um, so I don't know if you have this letter handy, but let me just read it out for everyone who's here today. Cash register receipts, payroll taxes, workers' comp payments, lease, utility bills, bank statements, delivery shipment receipts, and phone bills. Um, now, have you provided uh, any of this documentation to the city? And if so, could you itemize that for us? Okay. We have not provided anything beyond what you see in the declarations. Mm -hmm. We believe that that is substantial evidence. In fact, it's the only evidence that you have on this because you don't have any evidence from the city that my client wasn't operating during that period of time. All you have is evidence that it was, that they were. Now, this is evidence that was not provided. There was no legal obligation to provide it whatsoever. There's nothing in the ordinance, nor is there anything elsewhere in California law that gives the city attorney authority to, by a letter, demand from any private business or private citizen whatsoever that level of detailed information. If you have a subpoena, that's a different story. But there's never been a subpoena issued in this case. And so, therefore, the Compassion Center is aware and cognizant of the right to privacy of its members, its suppliers, its, uh, the people that it deals with, and the people that it takes care of. And this information is quite sensitive. People expect the center to keep it sensitive unless there is a legal obligation to turn it over and to release it. There was no legal obligation there uh, ever. There isn't one today. There's no subpoena issuing, and there is a constitutional right of privacy of the individuals involved that we have to respect. It's important to understand that the Compassion Center is under no legal obligation, and that more generally, when the government makes an accusation, whether it be, we don't think you were open at this period, or we think you committed murder, whatever it is, it's not the citizen's obligation to disprove that in our country. Not ever. 
Not, not for an instant. It's always the government's obligation to, to prove its own accusation. So even when you're accused of a crime, here, there's nothing like that going on, but just remember that basic principle of United States American jurisprudence. Here we've provided the, the evidence that the Compassion Center was operating continuously at, that, at the relevant period of time. And when you look at the city attorney's letter, you see that there are only two dates that they say somebody went out, some unidentified person went out and, said, and couldn't find the people operating there. And those dates were November 27th of 2007, and I believe it's January 8th of 2008, a period when there wasn't any 30-day provision. There was nothing in the law about discontinuing operations for, for that period of time. But we've rebutted it anyway because we've got the declaration from Mr. Saul Levitt, an attorney at law who swears under penalty of perjury regarding the continuous tenancy of the Compassion Center at that, at that location. He's the attorney for the landlord. He took the checks the payment of rent, and on his personal knowledge, going there and seeing during this relevant period that it is an operating, ongoing dispensary. And then there's the declaration of Patrick Formey, which is included with documentary evidence, including a business license certificate for that address, which was from the city of Santa Barbara, which is continuous, and the signatures of uh, 103 patients who certify that they obtained medical mar marijuana from the Compassion Center during that period. So I I am very confident that this is sufficient proof that the center did not continue oper discontinue operations for 30 days. Well, Mr. Gaynor, just in the interest of time, um, let me cut to the chase here on, on my question, and I appreciate your, your uh, thorough response. Um, is it, am, I, am I to understand that it is your current position um, that um, you will not be uh, providing any of this documentation to the city? You know, we, that is not a firm position. If, we, if, if it is of interest to the, the city and you want to enter into a confidentiality agreement, we may be able to negotiate giving you some documents that would otherwise be private. But that would have to be under a strict agreement to protect the confidentiality of the persons involved. Okay. Um, Mr. Vincent, um, uh, perhaps you can advise me whether today is the right venue or a subsequent venue um, to identify which of these types of documentation might be sufficient um, to address the issue, uh, providing substantial evidence regarding uh, demonstration of continuation of, of operation or business? Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Gaynor. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Gaynor. Mr. Chair, members of the Commission, the, the list of documentation in, in Ms. Ostringer's letter is illustrative. It's, it's and meant to be an example of evidence of any business, whether it was a collective or another type of business, of ongoing operations. And it doesn't say anything about, tell us who your patients are. It didn't do anything like that. So UPS, uh, some you know, evidence of utility bills, evidence that, now, the point, in Ms., and Ms. Ostringer makes this clear in the letter, is that depending on what is provided, more information may be necessary in, it, in order to corroborate the fact that a collective operated at that site. In other words, a utility bill in and of itself is, indicates that something was going on there. But if it's just a utility bill and nothing else, that doesn't tell you that a cooperative was going or a dispensary was occurring there. It just tells you that something was going there. The, since the collective did not provide any information, it was impossible to verify this. And so the city, based on the information that the city had, brought its case. I would submit that the ultimate location for the determination of is there sufficient evidence to prove up a case that this operation ceased to exist for the requisite period of time and that therefore no longer has its non-conforming status, that is best done at the Superior Court. So today you have a lot of evidence before you and you, I would suggest you make the decision today based on what's before you in the staff report as well as the evidence provided by the applicant. Okay, thank you, Mr. Vincent. Um, one of course, in the interest of moving along, yep. I want to come back to you for your other question, but I want to make sure that the other commissioners yes, thank you, Mr. have Chair. a chance to ask some questions. Ms. Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so, some of my questions uh, have already been asked. 
Uh, but I do have a question regarding the building itself. And uh, on our field trip, which I appreciated very much, uh, uh, you are proposing to, to uh, terminate a door uh, at the rear of the building. And uh, as you, uh, the entry sequence to the building is from the front, and then you have this waiting area. Then you have a secured connection back into your uh, dispensary. And uh, then you are terminating a, a, a door. And I'm concerned about safety. And if, if there is one way out of that building uh, and you have, a secured, uh, you have a secured portion of the building, uh, uh, I'm concerned for the health and safety of the people inside in case of fire or, uh, you know, in case of uh, someone coming in the front uh, to threaten. Uh, there's, I have that concern, and the building is no fortress, so uh, that, that that's one of the things I noticed, and I don't know if there's a building code, uh, I don't know the building code in and out, but I, th I would ask that staff look at that closely. I mean, I could see eliminating a window, but that back door, I don't know. You know, maybe it's, maybe there's another, it's just, I just want to make sure that that's up to code to do. Mr. Keller? Um, Mr. Chair, the the request to remove the door actually came from the Building and Safety Division. Oh, okay. The, there is a drop off from the outside to the inside through the door threshold that doesn't meet accessibility requirements, and the building has to be brought up to code uh, with the building permit for this dispensary. And there was also a concern from staff in the police department regarding security of the building because of the location of that door in the back. It's not visible from the street. So that was another concern. Okay, thank you. That answers my question. Uh, I don't have any other questions, actually. Uh, I, I would be... Uh, I, I would have been... I don't know. It doesn't matter. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Larson. Ms. Jacobs. Thank you, Chair Justice. Um, this is great because I get to get some curiosity satisfied. Um, I drive down that part of Delavina often, and I remember when it went for a brief time to something called the Harmonic Alliance. What was that? The Harmonic Alliance was a music store that my brother and I started, um, and because of there was some pressure from the DEA at the time that was prior to the ordinance, uh, there was a necessity to protect both the landlord and ourselves after being in, around for 11 years total now, but back then it was probably eight years. And um, that has since ceased during the Obama administration, but prior to that, during the Bush years, um, it was quite, there was quite an aggressive posturing by both the Office of Forfeiture and the Justice Department and the DEA through uh, with the help of Christy Stanley. And it was, uh, that's what that um, facility was in the front. Maybe I can, I can elaborate on that a bit. Thank you. This is addressed in the Declaration of Patrick for me, and he explains that uh, because, and there's a letter from the DEA to the landlord, uh, f which is attached to his declaration and made a part of it, and it ex he explains that based on this letter and the threatening posture that uh, federal officials were taking contrary to California law at this particular period of time, uh, they decided that they would uh, close the front portion of the shop and open up, uh, open up or a music store called a Harmonic Alliance in the front, and that is in fact what I they do did. I understand that. I understand. Yes. Yeah. And um, so it was I never a music went store. into the Harmonic Alliance, and I was kind of curious about what it was. Yeah, it's but a music during store. During that time, yeah. um, because federal law does trump state law, during that time, your collective was operating out the kind of on the backyard model, out the back door. Is that right? Well. Uh, because that would have the, the been idea legal. of federal law. Yeah, the idea of that. federal law, stating Trump law, was something that really hadn't been decided or hadn't been uh, properly vetted in courts. So under the, there were some statements made that federal law was trumping state law, but still there was this ambiguity. And I was working closely with the attorney general's office uh, since year 2000. And in fact, I worked on my model with Bill Lockyer for this for the city of Santa Barbara when Harriet Miller was mayor. So I spent an enormous amount of time trying to do something that would be righteous for this town, and put a lot of time in Sacramento.
personally in the Attorney General's office. And so there was a debate really between the aggression of the federal government and states' rights. And, um, and so uh, to answer your question, I'm really there was some ambiguity about the thing. And since we've studied, I have a med background, and since I understand very well the medical aspects of it and the benefits, I felt it was only a matter of time till uh, the medical the therapeutic benefits of cannabis would somehow emerge and kind of start to dissipate some of this um, bad drug war policy. But under that Compassionate Use Act, it was fine for you to uh, keep your collective going out that back door. As a collective, it was. Right. That's what I was trying to get at. Good. Because um, one of the things that has always been difficult in these deliberations is to understand something that this building demonstrates very well which is that a backyard, a back door, a van, all of these kinds of uh, collective dispensaries are legal, they're operating. No decision that we make up here is going to stop those folks from getting their medicine. What we're deciding is a land use decision about permitted retail storefronts. So I just want to be really clear that what we're talking about is retail storefronts with permits. That's what this ordinance is about. The people who get their medicine are part of the collective. I may be wrong. Maybe Mr. Vincent could give me advice on this, but if this permit were denied... I think they could go back to the back door backyard model. Am I right about that? That's one of the, it's an exceptional point. Uh, sorry, Mr. I'll, okay. I'll speak after <clears throat> you. This is I, I, this I'd like is to bring this back to staff. questions as opposed to comments. This is my question to staff because I think it is relevant, Mr. Chair. Good, good. Okay. Mr. Vincent. Mr. Chair, members of the commission, it, the back door model. Or backyard or backyard and, and that's and I think that's the probably the key point is a backyard a patient and caregiver that's what 215 talked about the dispensary model to be permitted has certain elements to it to to uh, it would be I think it would be an open question as to whether or not a dispensary could operate legally through the back door Either you are an upfront dispensary that is permitted in accordance with the effective laws of the city, or you have to justify yourself as the patient caregiver model that is not a dispensary that is and I think those are two different things, and a dis a collective may not be able to prove themselves as the patient caregiver depending on how they behave. And, and so that's the cities the city has gone the direction of we have an ordinance that says if you wish to operate in the retail dispensary model this is how you do it if you want to operate in another model then you've got to be proving yourself up under 215 and the compassionate use act and uh, SB 420 and those are different criteria a collective may or may not be able to do that, but it will depend on th how they behave, how they set up their operations. But so I, I mean, I think that your your point uh, you, that uh, Commissioner Jacob said a second ago or a minute ago now that we're talking about retail dispensing of medical cannabis, right. Actually, and this is the way you do it in the city of Santa Barbara. Yeah. And I just one last sentence on. Uh, the ordinance's terminology, it is the storefront dispensary ordinance. And the storefront dispensary ordinance specifies that the storefront opens onto the street and that the waiting room is visible from the street. Okay, thank you. Great. Ms. Lodge, I skipped over you. <laughs> well, I didn't have my light on at first. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I want, I want to get clear of just what it is that is before us. Um, the staff hearing officer uh, denied the, the quick request, as I understand it, on the basis of 
the rot burglary at an off-site storage facility, indicating uh, that um, you know that there might be issues because that happened and it involved the police. That this was well, it says, well, what it says here. Therefore, the application does not meet the, this criterion. And the other issue um, was the issue of whether or not it had been in continuous operation. Is is that is that correct? Is is this specifically what is before us, or is it more than that? Your Justice Commissioner Lodge, um, well, what's before you is the actual permit. My decision is now. Well, it was a denial, but it was suspended. So you have the actual decision on the permit. My concerns involved two areas. One was the security plan and operation plan um, and follow through of that. And then also, again, the legal status of the existing dispensary. And through the discussions, I was going to continue the item to continue to work on um, the security plan because that's um, an area that could be, you know, proved upon and probably could be um, overcome. However, through discussions, additional discussions with the police department and staff, um, I heard additional concerns or ongoing concerns regarding the follow through on the security plan and then also the fact that staff has given the applicant um, a lot of time to provide the information to try to show that it is legally nonconforming. I thought the best course of action would be to deny the application and have it come before your commission. So again, my, my concerns focused on two areas. One was the security plan and operation plan and then the, um, the status of the existing dispensary. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Sure. Larry. Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll try and uh, do some yes or no ones quickly and then I have one open-ended one. Um, I'll just swivel until I see one of you guys uh, open up. The, uh, the reference to the open operations at 3532 State Street, was there a business license present during that time for that location? Chair Justice, um, Commissioner uh, Jordan, yes, I believe there was. Okay. And then um, regardless of the decision today, as far as we look down the road, does not this um, applicant still face closure on uh, either January 24th last or March 24th in order to comply with all the current ordinances? Commissioner Jordan, yes. Okay. And Mr. Vincent, um, one of the first slides that Mr. Gullick. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. Before before we can move on to the next question, I, um, you were saying not re ignoring today's decision. However, you can't ignore today's decision if this commission grants the permit, right. and unless that and if that if that decision becomes final, then that would moot out the non-existence of the, of the dispensary. In other words, it they would have be, a, It wouldn't still be subject to the ordinance that gave them one of two choices of an amortization period, one of which has already expired and one that's coming up? If a permit is granted under the ordinance, they would then be a permitted site under the current ordinance that is in effect today, and they would continue on as a permitted location. Okay. And then uh, the, one of the early slides that Mr. Gullett put up that uh, referenced um, the, the last line of it was a phrase of another business. It had to do with the, uh, you remember the one, it had to do with, uh, thank you, there it is. So I can read that either way also. I can, and, and staff made the point that their interpretation of that is to an existing business as well as another business. And I'm just wondering what your advice would be today from a legal standpoint on whether that interpretation is is accurate or if we could read that both ways the the fact that they they have there is a dispute over whether or not their nonconforming status uh, it was properly maintained and one way to look at that is that the prior business ceased to exist so now even though it's the same name it's a new 
a new business. Okay. Uh, and also, I, I think that in general that is consistent with the intent of that criteria to get at the heart of whether or not an operator has has acted lawfully, unlawfully, appropriately, inappropriately. Okay. And then one of the arguments made in the applicant's uh, documents was that uh, uh, a subsequent ordinance certainly can't change the terms of prior ordinances, and I'm going to ask you to confirm my disagreement with that, but of course that is true. The city does that all the time, right? We change ordinances, and if you're if you fall within the scope of that ordinance that was a prior ordinance, you now fall within a scope of a revised ordinance, correct? I'm sorry, I, I'd like to have you ask that question again. Sorry, if, I was... Uh, if I'm operating under an ordinance that was enacted in 1984, and the, and the ordinance is uh, revised in 2010, and it grabs me up in, in that ordinance as part of my operations, I am subject to the new ordinance's uh, provisions, correct? In general, when a land use is existing and the land use laws change, it, it, it falls into the status of legal, existing, non-conforming. That, I mean, and, and I think this has been one of those situations that the medical marijuana ordinance for the city has been an example where we've seen legal non-conforming operations continuing. So when you say it grabs you up, um, it, it grabs existing non-conforming can continue their, legal, their land use uh, without change. Specifically, though, in, the, in the, uh, the medical marijuana dispensary ordinance, we've made an effort in the revisions to that ordinance to remove the prior operations that do not comply with the most current ordinance, right? That is true. Okay. And then um, this whole burden of proof thing, uh, you were open, you were closed. Uh, you're comfortable and you'd give advice that we should be comfortable that uh, the burden of proof is on the applicant to show that he was open rather than the burden of proof is on the city at this venue to show that he was closed? The, the burden of proof, the, the, uh, a bur burden of proof is, is a standard that is typically applied in a court of law. And the standard for you is substantial evidence supporting your decision. You do have to have substantial evidence to support your decision. I believe that the evidence before you, both from the, state, from the city as well as the applicant, is well within the evidence that you normally receive as planning commissioners to make your decision. So depending on how you, there is evidence to support your decision today. Okay, I'd agree. And then for staff, one last one. Um, I'm curious if somebody could give me an explanation um, back to those two visits, those two uh, inspections, on what takes place. A, a guy comes up in a car, does he get out of the car, does he knock on the door, does he walk around the building and look in the windows? What actually takes place during those inspections? Commissioner Jordan, um, normally it's a, it's a drive up and walk around. Sometimes we walk in, but I don't know if that happened this time. Okay, so, but it would actually be somebody to get out of the car, walk on the property, look around to see if they could see evidence of operations or not, um, certainly walk around to the back side of the building. Usually, I, like I said, I, I, don't, I can't say that that happened in okay. these two site visits, but normally, normally when we go out for an enforcement case for uses, we try to determine what the use is and that we, we take whatever measure we can to, to figure okay. that out. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You bet. Uh, Ms. Larson, do you have another question? No, sir. Okay. Ms. Uh, Schwartz, did you have one last question? Well, Mr. Chair, did you want to your... go next? You haven't had an opportunity. I'd I, be happy to wait. No, I'm, I'm uh, adequately informed by the questions of my colleagues as far as the Okay, yes, concerned. then I would like to ask a couple of additional ones, um, and Captain Martell, I'm not sure if you would be uh, best positioned to answer this, but from hearing Ms. Jordan's reference <coughs> to what I thought was the police department's um, concerns about follow-through of enhancing 
or follow through of enhancing the security plan at the building. Could you speak to that? Commissioners, uh, Commissioners in regards to the security plan, I viewed the uh, current security plan that's being proposed, and administratively, I, I believe that's uh, that's proper in regards to at least for the submittal of the permit. So then do you not have concerns at this time? I don't have any concerns over the building itself and the security aspect of it, which includes the, the breakage alarms and the cameras surrounding the building. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. Lastly, um, I have a question about the storage of cannabis. You know, in looking at our ordinance, we very specifically see uh, that on-site storage is required, and I'm looking at... 28.80.060 E2. Uh, I know there had been some off-site storage, Mr. Formey. We've heard about that, and that's referenced in our documentation. What is the current practice regarding the storage of the medical marijuana for use by your patients? Um, after the incident, um, we, we've worked with Captain Martell, and also there was a, a new requirement uh, updating the, the ordinance, uh, which stated that all cannabis turned over to the center be stored on site. And that is the agreement that I signed into, and I also wrote uh, a letter uh, and provided to Dan Gullett stating that I would abide by that as well. So is that your current practice? It's the current practice that cannabis that is turned over to the center stays in the center. And during the site visit, you might have seen the boxes, and so we've taken that now, that approach. In the back room? In the back near room. Near the back door and the, and the restroom, that area? Yes, and, okay. and that, yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Jordan, you have any other questions here? Okay, okay thank you. Okay, at this point in time, uh, staff, do you have anything else at, at this point? Uh, I, I do, Mr. Chair, and uh, apologies to the commission. Um, in my absence, I didn't realize that the proposed conditions of approval were changed. Um, so I had uh, the slide regarding additional changes staff recommended to the conditions of approval. Um, so with the changes that were done, these are the two that, that would remain. Condition B, which was about breakage sensors or bars, is no longer needed, and that changed to Condition C to just um, reconcile the number of security cameras. So that's it. Okay, thank you. At this point in time, I'm going to open up the public uh, comment portion. Uh, on this item. Uh, in doing so, I want to be clear that this is not uh, the time and place for uh, debating the merits uh, or demerits of the marijuana ordinance as it pertains to the city as a whole. We are here to deliberate on this project in this location with the information provided by the applicant and the staff uh, so I'm going to urge folks to uh, be as focused as you possibly can. Uh, and I'm going to start um, with Mr. Austin McRae and ask that you limit your, your comments to three minutes. Uh, we have five speakers, six speakers. Uh, and if you haven't submitted a speaker slip, uh, uh, please go ahead and fill one out there at the back of the room, and you can turn it into Mr. Cato here. I want to make sure that everybody is heard on this matter, uh, but I'm going to be uh, fairly strict in uh, adhering to this uh, three-minute rule. Uh, so our first speaker is Austin McRae, and he will be followed um, by uh, Mansfield Earhart. I can't read the first name, but uh, if you could be prepared to come up after Mr. McRae, that would be great. Mr. McCray? Okay, Mr. McCray is gone. Uh, Mr. Mansfield Earhart? Mr. Earhart here? Who's calling? Sorry, I didn't hear uh, It looks like Anna Mansfield Earhart. Herman? No. Oh. No, no. Okay. Okay, that one's done. Uh, next speaker is Ruth. Ruth Hammett, Ms. Hammett, will be followed by Jim Coleman. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. 
Some of you know me by the name Hawthor Hammett, and uh, the reason I'm using my legal name today, Ruth Hammett, is because I'm willing to swear, um, you know, legally that the Compassion Center never quit operating. And that's why I'm using my legal name today. I'm here in support of my medical cannabis collective, the Compassion Center. I've been a member of the collective for over 10 years. During that time, the Compassion Center has supplied me with high quality medication at a fair price without interruption. This is the only source I've used during this time. There are many reasons. The staff includes registered nurses who have been quite helpful to me. There are a variety of um, salves and ointments that are available, and the nurses know just what kinds of things uh, are good for my medical needs. These items are not available just anywhere. The staff has been so consistent over these 10 years, and I feel a high level of comfort there and dignity. The location is close to where I live, and that means a lot to me because I don't drive, and sometimes I'm really not filling up to taking the bus. I have rheumatoid arthritis. The location is close to where I live, and as I said, that's, a, that's extremely important to me. The security, I feel, is quite excellent, and the place is very discreet. There's no big sign. In fact, most people don't even know that there is a, a dispensary there at that location. Even long-time patients like me have to go through the same security procedures as new people, and um, to me, that, that kind of sums it up right there. Even though they all know me, I do not get a break on that. I go through the same security procedures as everyone else. The Compassion Center um, really helps. You know, it's, it's hard having a disability. It really is, but it helps. And I urge you to let this model collective continue to serve the community. I want to completely feel fine about going through the front door as I am right now with dignity. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jim Coleman, to be followed by Paul Nolan. Mr. Coleman? My name is Jim Coleman, and I'm a 27-year resident of Santa Barbara, and I've been with the collective now as a patient there for, I guess, about a year and a half, and uh, I just live about a block and a half away from there, so it's a really convenient source an easy location for me to get to since I don't drive and I don't even have any money to have a car anyway. So uh, I'm really happy with their service and uh, the, the security is adequate there and uh, it's a loving and compassionate and caring place of which we certainly have a shortage of here in our community. So I just hope that this permit is uh, extended and that uh, we can look forward to safe and legal access to our medication that our doctors have prescribed for us. And I'm happy that they have nurses there to aid us in knowing what medications might be best for a particular uh, physical or emotional ailment that we have. So I thank you all for your time, and uh, I hope that all goes well. Thank you, Mr. Coleman. Um, Paul Nolan? Hello. Um, good um, okay, can, I guess I can be heard a little bit better now. Thank you. Um, following every, all the discourse here and, and the evidence provided initially and, and the excellent comments of these previous speakers uh, from the audience, I don't have much to add other than the fact that I've used the place since 2006. Um, I've never felt uh, in, in any way... Uh, intimidated or fearful or um, diminished um, and the, the nurses have been very useful for me. I suffer from neuropathic pain and uh, basically there's there's no good solution for that and cannabis comes the closest. I don't, although I don't live within the city limits, um, I've consistently gone to the, the, the Compassionate Care Center because of, of its reputation of being discreet and secure and having the, the nurses on hand. And I've, all of my interactions over that period of time have been excellent. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nolan. Our next speaker is David Berman. Berman, I'm sorry. Oh, can you hand these out to the... 
Uh, Mr. Cato, could I get those other speaker slips when you have a moment? Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the Planning Commission, uh, I've been practicing medicine for over 40 years. I've worked for the United States Public Health Service. I've worked for the State of California. I run a county health department. I've been a director, uh, a medical officer, and I was a director of the Santa Barbara Regional Health Authority for a long time. I think I know something about the practice of medicine. I know something about quality and I know something about medicinal cannabis. I brought along chapters 13 and 14 of a book that I'm working on uh, on drug policy. It's not all about marijuana, it's just a little bit. And it talks to you about the science. So just as your land use planners and know a lot about that and something about medicine, I'm a doctor and I know a lot about medicine and less about land use planning. I want to give you my frame of reference so that you can better understand the foundation of my testimony. First, cannabis is medicine. It has appeared in every major pharmacopoeia ever written in the history of the world. As Dr. Donald Abrams, a professor at UCSF School of Medicine and a cannabinoid researcher says, except for 1942 to 1996 in the U.S., cannabis has been a medicine for the last 5,000 years. So I ask you to consider this historical fact and address this appeal accordingly. I'm in full agreement with the position of Dr. Philip DeLeo, immediate past president of the Santa Barbara County Medical Society, regarding Santa Barbara's dispensary ordinance. Last July, he wrote in his regular Medical Society bulletin column, column that if the city council were serious about drafting a medical dispensary ordinance, they would call together an advisory committee of health care professionals. Well, they didn't do that. And we can only speculate on what that committee would have said. In my mind, one of the most likely outcomes would have been to treat cannabis as we would any other medicine. We've tried that once in this country from 1854 to 1942, when cannabis was in the United States pharmacopoeia. I defy you or anybody else to find a history of problems when cannabis was available in pharmacies. At that time, it was the third most commonly used medicine in the U.S. and was available both over the counter and by prescription. It was accepted by organized medicine. The American Medical Association testified against the Marijuana Tax Act and said they saw no problems with the medicinal use. In the 1920s, the University of Minnesota had their pharmacy students make tincture of cannabis, not to teach them about cannabis, but to teach them how to make tinctures. My father, who started practicing pharmacy as a pharmacy student in 1928, never had any untoward incidents in terms of the dispensing or over-the-counter sale of cannabis through 1941 when it stopped being legal. Colonel James Phelan, the editor of the medical journal uh, Military Medicine, wrote an editorial in 1943 and another in 1954 assailing what he termed the marijuana bugaboo. I recently returned from Israel where I attended a marvelous conference entitled Cannabinoids in Biology and Medicine, put on in the honor of Dr. Raphael Meshulam at the time of his 80th birthday. Uh, he was the uh, isolator of THC in 1964, and he characterized the endocannabinoid system in 1992. It was attended by medical clinicians and top scientists who presented the most up-to-date research data on cannabis and cannabinoids. I wish you all could have been there. But what does this all have to do with the appeal before you? Just this. Since cannabis is a medicine, you should treat it as such. The system of medicine that we have for handling and distributing medicine, while not perfect, does recognize that nurses and pharmacists are trained and competent to dispense, and in the case of nurses, administer medicine. Now, in the 2005 Gonzalez versus Raich case, the four so-called liberals and two would-be conservatives on the uh, Supreme Court threw you a curve by continuing to stretch the Commerce Clause beyond all recognition and continuing the precedent of the 1942 Wickard versus Filburn decision. Mr. Berman, could you wrap up? I've got We're about a, four minutes. Excuse me. We're huh? about four minutes, so you need to wrap okay. up. 1988, the DEA said, not a problem. This should be rescheduled. That was the uh, chief administrative law judge. 150 health organizations have said this should be rescheduled. Here in Santa Barbara, the dispensary ordinance is not conservative enough in some areas and too restrictive in others. It should require that a dispensary be supervised by either a pharmacist or a nurse. The planning process appears to have squeezed out the pharmacy, who would arguably have challenged the Compassion Center for the honor of most medical professionalism in dispensing cannabis in Santa Barbara. And now that there is an effort uh, to shutter 
the Compassion Center, the oldest and most medically professional dispensary in Santa Barbara. And as a physician, I find it disturbing. It doesn't make any sense to me or my patients. I have ill patients. Many are elderly. Although I must admit, yesterday was my birthday, and the definition of elderly keeps getting older as I get older. Okay. But anyway, nevertheless, you, many of these folks have multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease. I got two paragraphs, two short paragraphs left. Alzheimer's, and actually, really, the Alzheimer's patients' spouses, cancer, excruciating back pain, and other similar serious diseases. And they're delighted when they hear that Santa Barbara has a dispensary that has a nurse present. Should you deny this appeal, the next closest medically professional run dispensary is in Los Angeles. Forcing our sickest patients to have to go these lengths is unconscionable. Thank you. We know how important health care is to Americans. Just look at the emotional reaction to the recent efforts on health care reform. Dr. Well, Berman? here we are not dealing with hypothetical, Dr. but Berman? real flesh and blood, ill and infirm. I appeal Dr. to Berman? you as human beings and as Americans to test, trust your conscience and grant this appeal. I'm sorry for running over. I wanted to get to the conclusion. Me sorry, too. you're... Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Gregory Fa Franks, to be followed by Stephen Hosser. Mr. Franks? Hi, my name is Gregory Franks. Pleasure to be in front of you today. Um, I'm 47 years old. I'm a Santa Barbara native. Uh, until recently, I was a pretty healthy person. Um, I have three discs in my back that uh, need to be fused. Uh, I'm in a lot of pain, and I've been that way for uh, quite a few years. And, um, and unfortunately, the, I've been given opiates that are known as heroin and other types of uh, drugs that um, are very controlled. Um, unfortunately, they have some very negative side effects. And uh, and for one of the side effects is that they don't last as long as they're prescribed for, and uh, and I'm left being in pain, and I have to uh, find a way to relieve that. And I was given um, a medical prescription by a doctor, and uh, and he told me that uh, to to get the best you could so you didn't have to smoke as much. Um, which is exactly opposite of what the tobacco companies are doing. But anyway, uh, the only real relief I'm able to get and be able uh, to remain a conscious and social person with half of my mind is by taking cannabis a few times a day. And uh, I live in the neighborhood. I went to Peabody Elementary School. It's literally uh, half a mile from my house. I can't walk that far. So it's it's necessary for me to have a place that's locally available, and um, it's also uh, it's very discreet. Um, the social uh, uh, mores of even just doing this on a, um, a recreational basis is looked down upon and frowned upon by most people. In fact, most people laugh when you say you're using it medically. Um, I think that's ridiculous, uh, and I can't get it anywhere else except illegally. And this is... Uh, a place that I've relied upon for uh, over two years. And so um, I would really appreciate it uh, so if I didn't have to have somebody drive me to Los Angeles to pick up medicine that a doctor said that is valuable and necessary for me. And I appreciate your time, and I hope you pass the, this ordinance allowing um, the Compassion Center to stay open. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Mr. Franks. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Stephen. Um, Jose. Jose. Hi, my name is Steve Jose. When I write a prescription for an FDA-approved drug, I'm thankful that there's a pharmacist there who can read my writing, as you have just had some issues with. Also read my prescription, the dosage and duration of that. They check on that. I'm thankful when I write a letter of approval or recommendation for medicinal cannabis that there are nurses that are available that can advise my patients on the best form and the best type of medication to be used. I'm confident that the people at the Compassion Center can do this because I've attended medical cannabis conferences that offered CME credits where staff was there learning as I was learning about the uses in different varieties. Thank you. Thank you. Our last speaker is Mr. Bill Dops. <clears throat> Mr. Dops. I'm a recovering alcoholic, 
I haven't had any alcohol for about 25 years, and due to the help of some very wonderful professional people, doctors and nurses and consultants and all that. And I just want to just want to say, confirm how much that uh, cannabis has helped me get through with my anxiety. I was in Korea in the early 50s and had some pretty scary experiences over there and subsequently began drinking quite heavily, which I did for about 15 years. And I'm um, still getting along in society and keeping a job and having hangovers and all that. But uh, I discovered the um, availability of medical cannabis and I availed myself, which I am now doing. Um, one of the instrumental people in that is in this room. I think he just said something to you guys. Anyway, it's been a very, very helpful um, addition to my uh, medical uh, situation. And I'm able to function in society and with my family. And the the uh, um, deportment of people in the def in the different um, facilities here uh, for cannabis, medical cannabis, have all been, for the most part, very helpful and knowledgeable and kind of fun. <laughs> so anyway, that I just wanted to make that statement. And uh, I think some of the one at least one of the people that uh, has helped me a great deal is here today. So anyway. Thank you very much, and hang in there. Thank you, Mr. Duffs. Is there anybody else who'd like to approach and speak to the commission? I actually have a couple of points that I'd like to make. If the will. Okay, what I would like to do is to close the public hearing and then provide you three minutes uh, to make any additional comments. So the public portion of this meeting is closed, and I'd like to hear from the applicant. Please. Thank you, Chairman Justice. I, I will be very brief. Uh, just a couple of points. First, I, I want to say that s there have been uh, some focus on Criterion 12, but I think that uh, Commissioner Lodge, I think, was who pointed out it's not really about Criterion 12. And I don't think that it would be doing a service to the community to focus exclusively on the legal criteria. It's really about the discretionary decision that the city attorney has said you're, you're entitled to make here. And we are asking you to make the right decision based on the evidence that we've put forward. I do want to respond to something that Mr. Vincent, if, if I've got his name correctly, from the city attorney's office did say. He uh, took the position that uh, maybe this conflict uh, uh, about the 30 days is properly resolved in court. Uh, I have been in communication with Mr. Wiley himself, and uh, I have an email message from him that states that uh, if the per permit is granted by the commission or by the city council, he will dismiss the lawsuit and that will be the end of it. So Mr. Wiley takes a rather different position and uh, if it's necessary you would like that, I can dig out that email and have it for you uh, perhaps even this afternoon by email. So if, you, if you'd like that. Uh, so that is the position of Mr. Wiley that uh, if the permit's granted, uh, the city will dismiss and that will be the end of it. And of course, as far as we're concerned, uh, Mr. Formey and the Compassion Center will continue providing the services that they provide to the community and we have no desire to litigate anything whatsoever. Uh, the other point that I wanted to make is that indeed, as Commissioner uh, Jacobs pointed out, there is a storefront dispensary ordinance. But it's also very, very important to understand that for the period of time during which the planning commission, planning staff rather erroneously says uh, that my clients weren't operating, aside from the fact that there's plenty of evidence that they were, the ordinance at that point said nothing about storefronts. That's the pre-2008 ordinance didn't come into existence until after the events that we're talking about. And it said nothing about ordinate, about storefronts and nothing about 30 days. It's simply not there, so that provision doesn't come in. During all the periods that there was a storefront, that, there, that it did say that, they operated correctly as a storefront ordinance, as a storefront dispensary. So once again, I don't want to repeat myself, but I think we've laid forth, set forth as best we could, why 
in the discretionary decision that you have to make here. You shouldn't be hung up on legal technicalities. You should try to do the right thing. There are going to be at least three permitted dispensaries. If this dispensary is, is not granted a permit and we have to sue and someday we're, we're, up, we're ultimately lose, you're going to have another dispensary. And they may not have registered nurses on staff. And there may not be physicians who strongly endorse them. And they may not cater to the mature patients and give them the help and the needs and the services of their needs that they deserve. Thank you for your attention to this and your serious informed judgment on this matter. Thanks. Thank you. All right, the matter is back to the commission. Uh, who would like to open up? Ms. Schwartz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess I will in the interest of time. So today before us, we're not debating the philosophical or actually the historical context in which cannabis has been used medically or the benefits of it. We have a 1996 state law followed by a Senate bill, followed by 2008 Attorney General guidelines that made it difficult for this commission last year to wrestle with appropriate uh, language and requirements for dispensaries in the city of Santa Barbara. And yes, the Compassionate Center has uh, been in operation for long before our ordinances were in place. Um, I appreciate and admire that we have um, stellar healthcare professionals such as Dr. Hosea, who I'm familiar with, um, vouching for the professionalism of your operation. Um, that that certainly is uh, leaves an imprint on me. I appreciate uh, from the documentation we have that you seem to be a good neighbor. That's very important to me because we have some examples elsewhere in our community where there is not that is not the case. Um, I certainly take into strong consideration that the Compassion Center is one of the three uh, dispensaries that we've capped under our ordinance. If you were beyond the three, if you were one that pushed us beyond that, uh, I would certainly have some greater concerns. Now, in terms of coming into compliance, I can't stress enough how troubled I am with the lack of some areas of compliance, uh, both from the documentation and from talking to staff and from hearing from Mr. Vincent. Um, I may need to leave my, my vote uh, on the side because of my time constraint, uh, but would support my uh, fellow commissioner's majority vote. Uh, but let me say that on balance. I'd like to find a way to um, appropriately bring you into compliance. I don't know what that time frame might be. I would leave that to the city attorney's office and staff. Um, if they believe that they've given your center the opportunity to do that and it's not been forthcoming, um, which is why I pressed you, Mr. Gaynor, for whether or not you would uh, be willing to submit some of that paperwork, uh, to me, that's critical. But again, I leave it to the city attorney's office and to staff to determine uh, exactly what additional materials need to be submitted. Um, now, in terms of litigation, litigation is costly. We all know that. Uh, and whether it's the trial scheduled for June or it's your potential legal response to the outcome here at the Planning Commission and or a further appeal to City Council, if, if that were uh, to come about, um, I can't imagine that in a time of great economic constraint, because we are still in a recession, I do not think it would be good stewards of taxpayer resources for us to engage in litigation that potentially we could otherwise resolve, I say potentially because I don't know if the outstanding issues are resolvable. I would like to be cautiously optimistic that they are, uh, but uh, since I will not be carrying that ball to ensure that they are, I leave that in the capable hands of, of other city staff, city attorney and staff. Um, so with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I think those are my comments for now, and I'd like to hear from my fellow commissioners. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Schwartz. Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, last week, this was clearly to me uh, just an issue uh, of procedure and, and especially whether they had been continuously in operation. And I, I still think I'm going to fall on the wrong side of where the applicant wants to be. But uh, I, I just want to say I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed in this process when part of our packet involves uh, uh, as evidence that inspections were made and the best answer we can get back as to what took place as those inspections is we don't know. 
we think the guy got out of the car and we think he maybe looked at the front of the building and we don't know if he looked at the back of the building and there, we don't know if there were pictures taken of if there were vehicles in the lot, if there were lights on inside. And that really starts to work at me and uh, bother me to narrow the gap back down in the process of how you're weighing both sides. Um, if, if, if this ends up not in the applicant's favor and he ends up going to litigation, I certainly hope that that wasn't the full answer and that we're not standing somewhere else where somebody's making a decision based on an evidence of, of part, part of the evidence accruing up uh, with inspections, but nobody knows what took place those days by the inspector. Um, on the other side, I'm, I'm also disappointed with the, the, uh, the stance or the attitude shown by the applicant on putting evidence in front of us and your um, uh, narrative there on what is or isn't required constitutionally or, or what should be required. Um, those of us that were on the staff visit the other day met some of your workers. Um, uh, you could have a, a California DE6 payroll report form from the time period in question that showed a person was paid wages to and was reported to the state of California, and that could be in our packet today. Uh, any of the other illustrative evidence points that Mr. Vincent talked about could have been in our packet today, and frankly, I would have looked at that a lot more favorably than the lack of evidence. The, uh, the provision of just a uh, hundred some names and signatures on a piece of paper when you knew that the issue was that the front of the building was closed and people were going in the back would have been much more illustrative to me if those people had signed a statement that said, on this date, at this time, I was there for treatment and I entered through the back door. If you had 103 of those and that was sitting in front of me today, I would say you're certainly making a case for your your stance that a mistake was made because the front of the building was something rather than the back of the building. Um, and I'm certainly, I'm, I think we're probably just going to kick the can down the road, and that's great. I, I, you can take that appeal to the, next, uh, to the next level, and I think that's probably with what you presented today where it belongs. I'm not willing to say that uh, the public interests right now trump a obvious uh, lack of compliance with an existing ordinance. I don't think that's my job. I think my job is to look at that ordinance and apply it to your situation. Um, so obviously, I, I still am in the, in, on the side of, uh, um, of staff's recommendation. And if we get that far too, um, the finding paragraph on staff's recommendation on page five in section eight, after it takes us that far and, and says that the evidence is this, and one of the components, one of the components of the evidence is that we're saying the person was not continuously open, I find it hard to believe too that we also put the word in there, in quotes, apparently operating. Because it seems to me we're being asked to make a finding that they weren't operating, not that they weren't apparently operating. So I would uh, encourage us to uh, remove that word too and actually make a finding. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Uh, Ms. Ms. Jacobs. Uh, thank you, Chair Justice. I'll make it short because I agree um, quite consistently with Mr. Jordan's comments. Um, and uh, we'll probably we'll, you'll probably be seeing my vote go that way as well. Um, the sequence of letters and so on that I see in our report uh, tell the story that leads me to make the findings that staff has recommended. Um, but with some of the same uh, misgivings on both sides about the uh, thoroughness of the evidence before us. Um, should this go to a next iteration uh, with recommendations in, to the applicant, I would suggest that when I was reading the operations and especially the security section, uh, it suggested or indicated that a nurse would be providing the kind of monitoring and security uh, that in other similar operations we have requested a security guard for. And I don't think that a nurse who is in charge of patient care should be also out in the parking lot doing security work, and I would ask that that be changed. 
Thank you. Ms. Lodge? Thank you, Mr. Chair. This, this seems to be a bit of a he said, she said situation. Um, but I think in, in looking at the operation of the dispensary as a whole, um, given that there are single family residences right behind, the, the neighbors, the businesses on either side seem to have no problem with them, and that they seem to be the most professionally run dispensary in town. Um, I'm inclined to disagree with my colleagues here. Um, it, when the out of compliance, tell me, out of what, in what ways have they been out of compliance? The question for staff? Yes, for staff. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioners, uh, the, 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 the way the dispensary has been out of compliance is that it, um, staff asserts that it, it discontinued operation for that 30 days. And um, that in relation to um, that issuance criteria 12, which isn't a finding, but it is something that um, the Planning Commission is asked to consider um, when considering to approve the project. So that that's where it is not it is purportedly non-compliant. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, I uh, I am troubled too by the fact that all these people had to disclose and compromise their own confidentiality to come forward when a freaking utility bill would have done the job. I'm really disturbed by that. And I find that, that, that the uh, uh, sign permit or something, you know, there must be something from that time that you could show that would spare all these people having to expose that they are medically receiving treatment in a public document. So I, I'm, I'm chapped by this in a way. You know, I'm a little, I don't want to be angry, but this is a lot of people saying, you know, coming forward and swearing, or they haven't, it's not a sworn document either. I will, I will also say that there's no notification on this, nothing. Uh, it's a submitted list. But the fact that somebody has to, uh, or is asked to disclose their patient confidentiality to me just blows it apart. When you could easily furnish some simple piece of documentation that you're withholding. So I can't, I'm, I'm not there for you. I want to be for your patients, but I need, I need more from you. So I'm just, please let me do my comments. I'm not, this is important. It's important to your patients because there's a few things patients need. They need some locked files. They need to have security. They need to have, you know, some of the things you provide very beautifully. But this is not helping patients. So, you know, I have to get my cheeks on red. I worked in the medical profession for many years, and patient confidentiality is number one. It's not number five or three or two. It's number one. And it's cause for dismissal in any medical setting to have something like this happen publicly. So, you know, I, I want to go there, but I can't go there for you. When a simple documentation supporting that was requested would be filled. So I'm sorry to be firm about this, uh, but this isn't professional. So I can't, I can't support you. Thank you, Ms. Larson. Um, Ms. Schwartz is departing. I, I concur. Ms. Schwartz, if you could just stay for two minutes, I think we can get there. Uh, and I, I concur with um, all of my colleagues in terms of this operation being uh, one that appears to be well-managed, professional, uh, secure, and serving a need in Santa Barbara. It's clear. Uh, but like Ms. Larson and others, I need more information to be able to get over the 
over the hill uh, and be able to support uh, uh, the request that you're making of us. So uh, I'm not able to vote in, in favor of overruling the appeal. Or, uh, so I'm going to come down on the side of staff today, but I think if this goes to a next step, I think the simple provision of some detailed, a little bit more detailed information would uh, help the council or other people understand that this is, in fact, uh, been in operation continuously, would certainly get you to where you need to be. So with that, I would entertain a motion. Mr. Chair? Mr. Jordan. Uh, if you'd put up with me for a quick question first, because I brought up the word uh, and apparently in the findings. And um, Mr. Vincent, is it's on page five of the staff report right above the list of exhibits, the second line up. Is there a reason that that word would necessarily have to stay in there, the word apparently? Mr. Chair, members of the commission, regardless of your vote today or how you end up voting today, the city attorney's office and staff will, pre will prepare a resolution of findings that is consistent with your action. So if the the word apparently gives pause to the commission and they would like to make a more firm statement, that is fine and we will make the resolution reflect that. Okay, then uh, Mr. Chair, I would uh, move to make the uh, findings in the staff report and strike the word apparently. Second. Any further discussion? The motion's been made and seconded. Ms. Lodge. Just a comment. Just a comment, if I may, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess I, I, what the relevance of, the, of whether or not the dispensary was in continuous operation, um, I guess I, I just have a, I have a problem seeing why that is so important. And, uh, and so I, it's, it seems to me that all the rest that goes around it in terms of their operation as they, as they have been over, what, five years in this location. Um, it seems to me of, of more weight. Okay. Further discussion? Mr. Oh, Chair, I'm just, yes. um, just for the record, going to echo Commissioner Lodge's comments that she just made. Uh, thank you, Ms. Schwartz. Uh, so I'll call the question. All in favor of the motion is made by Mr. Jordan. Aye. 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 Opposed? No. Uh, motion passes six, pardon me, four to two. Uh, this decision is appealable to the city council within 10 days. Uh, thank you to everybody who spoke today uh, on the applicant. Uh, and we will now move on to our next item. Mr. Chair, if I could just have a brief moment. Yes, Mr. Uh, Jordan. Since I led the charge, I would also just like to uh, mention to the applicant, too, that uh, uh, I encourage you to go to the next step, and I encourage you to uh, take some of my uh, my comments uh, to that next step, because I believe that you can get over that step. I just hope that uh, you're willing to do so, because I agree with many of the points you made, uh, especially uh, Dr. Bierman's um, uh, uh, reference to uh, the pharmacy one and the use of registered nurses, that that, that is a unique and special uh, provision of, of your endeavor. And uh, so I hope you don't see this as the end of the road. You bet. At this point, we're going to move on to our administrative agenda. And the first item is uh, committee and liaison reports. And having not met for uh, nearly two months here, are there... Uh, uh, any committee reports, Ms. Larson? Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and, and some of us, some other committees haven't met either, and some have, uh, but we all had that break, so that was kind of nice. We didn't fall too far behind. Um, uh, I did attend the HLC meeting yesterday, and it was a very interesting meeting. I couldn't stay for the whole thing, but what I stayed, I was there from about 1 to about 4.30, um, and I'm happy to say that the architecture for the public market behind the Arlington is really, really coming along. And they have pulled back considerably. Uh, they are working on framing uh, views of the Arlington with landscaping. They are also, um, they will be coming to us because in pulling back, I believe they added some basement space, but I, I don't have the full 
thing for that, but they'll look to us at some point for uh, some development permitting. Um, but they do have a website now for the public market. If you wish to go look at it, it's uh, www.sbpublicmarket.com. So have a look. Uh, the other pro project I thought that was extremely interesting was the rehab of the S State Street Hotel, which at one point held a restaurant, or I think it's gone now, but there's a lot of discussion about a green wall on that hotel. And so uh, there was discussion of that and, and uh, you know, uh, snazzing up that building. So things are happening down below on Lower State. It's kind of good, good to see it shaking loose a little bit and and uh, and it's nice to know that the that the uh, project behind the Arlington is happening and it's not, just not going to be a, a hole in the ground or anything like that for us Thank so you. and staff hearing officer oh, I went to that meeting too let's see uh, we will probably see one of the uh, items on our agenda uh, but I didn't see it when I looked at our pending, so maybe the issues have been solved uh, regarding the uh, the big house. The appeal period actually for that project ends Monday, so they have until what is it four thirty this okay. coming Monday to appeal. So it might not be appealed, which would be great. Thanks. You bet. Ms. Lodge. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Water Commission met on January tenth, and. There are always a lot of media items on their agenda, but just a few of the some highlights. Uh, one of the items was a power purchase agreement for cogeneration at Ellis Stero Wastewater Treatment Plant. As you all know, there's methane glass that's created in the process of treating the wastewater, and they tried a what everyone thought and hoped would be a new technology um, that would be better than the more usual kind of thing, and it turned out not to work. So gone back to uh, using a, uh, bec because of uh, carbonyl sulfur in the water, carbon carbonyl sulfide in the gas, it messed up the equipment. And so they're going back to another form of energy saving there. Um, Long-term water supply plan should be completed in May. And then uh, the, uh, perhaps some of you were aware of this, but the city had an option on the top floor of the uh, mental health building, and, uh, the apartment and services building across the street from community development. And the city has taken it, and that is where the water department part of Public Works offices, some of them will be over there. And that's also where the uh, Water Commission will meet. They've been meeting in most of this last year in a conference room at the wastewater treatment plant instead of the very restricted conference, small co Public Works conference room at uh, the Garden Street, the... Uh, community Development Building on Garden Street. The terminal is continuing, uh, and it's on it's on track. Although now, uh, if there are no more rain delays, they expect a June completion of the new terminal, and that's that's a plain side view of the terminal. Um, the next slide. Uh, yeah, that's a, another shot sort of from the, looking toward the mountains more directly in the end of the terminal. Next slide. Um, that's looking from right in front of the existing terminal. The round part will be the new lobby entrance. Next slide. <laughs> that, actually, I'd asked for the slide showing them tossing the tiles from one to another, but I gave airport staff the wrong number. That's pretty good. Yeah, and it was. I asked. I happened to be out there when they were doing this. I asked, "What happens if they miss? It breaks." <laughs> but uh, they they were uh, happy up there with the tile. Next slide. This is the interior now. Um, the interior walls are going in. This is from the archway area, uh, and you can't see through it. Before when we were 
Planning Commission was on a visit before. You could just see there, there weren't any anything. There wasn't anything dividing the space, so you could see right straight through it. So now it's getting to look more like the way that it will. Um, and then yes, it's the next slide. They're getting, they've gotten the copper on the dome part of the tower. There's another next slide. The close up of that being put on. And the next slide, like Ms. Larson. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I haven't, we haven't gotten to that yet. Um, this is this is Lorianne David, who is the artist who is doing the mosaic tile flooring or artwork for the that round portion of the building, be the entry lobby. Uh, and this is working in her studio at home. Uh, next slide, Danny. This is a detail from it. Isn't that cute? <laughs> Anybody in the public is looking at that. That's it's a little plane drawing a uh, sky sky riding uh, a heart with S B in it. So love Santa. Where is she from? Maria David. She's been around for a long. She's local. Yeah, she's local. She's been around for a long time. So uh, and if anybody wants to see, you can actually see her working on it in the building. I. Uh, and a video that's online, available online, and the next slide gives the address. So there, there are several videos there that you can look at to see what's happening and get more details. Um, the, um, the title circulation project, which we went out and looked at uh, quite a few months ago, will be done in February. Well, this is February now, isn't it? Uh, it is a project that was mitigation for the overrun section of the runway, um, given a, an extension on it and relocation of the creek, and so this other portion of the airport, as you probably all remember, of the, of the slough has being res been restored, and that will be has, is to be completed this month. So, on just in general, their passengers count is up 1.2 percent over last year, oh, 2010 over 2009. So it's going in the right direction. And they'll soon have a new terminal to board and Good. be playing from. All right. Ms. Jacobs. Thank you, Chair Justice. Uh, just a quick update from the 101 Improvements Design Team. Uh, Mr. Bartlett and I are the Commission representatives to that team. Ms. Schwartz is our alternate. And the design team met several times over the break uh, because there is some urgency to at least one of the projects. Two of the uh, parts of the 101 Improvements Project are, that have been previously designed and approved, including approval from this commission and from the uh, Coastal Commission, are currently being redesigned and reviewed. Uh, one of them is the Cabrillo Underpass near Coast Village Road where it goes uh, under the railroad and down to the Bird Refuge. That's on a slow track um, and has plenty of time to be redesigned to make a better passageway for pedestrians, and I won't go into detail on that. Uh, the second project, which we have heard about here, but which is uh, coming forward again in, about, in a couple weeks uh, to the Commission, is on a faster track. That is the Salinas off-ramp, on-ramp interchange on the northbound 101. Uh, as it has currently just been finished, it is a two-lane uh, part of the freeway and uh, is scheduled in the original plans to be made into a three-lane with a high-occupancy high vehicle lane in the next phase of Highway 101 improvements, which are some years out. And there was a, um, I guess you'd call it a, a light bulb that went on, and um, the Montecito Association asked if, since all the construction uh, trucks are there, why not do the third lane now? Um, it seems like a good opportunity, um, but it would cause some significant changes to the appearance of that intersection. Uh, currently, as it is approved, the, the, uh, the uh, Salinas Interchange is the cover art for the design guidelines for the 101 improvements. It shows lush tree and median plantings. 
Um, however, if we do rush to take advantage of this opportunity to put the third lane in now, uh, that landscaping will go away and be replaced by a three-foot high metal median unlandscaped and, um, and a wall. So um, it will be a choice that I guess ultimately City Council will be making uh, whether they want to uh, go for it now or wait further down the line when there would be an, an opportunity to uh, think the design through a little more um, with a little more time. So we'll be seeing that in a couple of weeks. Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, quickly, um, Creeks Division and uh, Santa Barbara Golf Club, known as Muni, are getting ready in the next month or so to have a grand opening because they feel it's time to uh, showcase the uh, Creeks project that's now who, about a year and a half old there, and uh, all the ground cover and trees have grown in. The uh, large berm dam is now about completely filled with a lake. Uh, ducks and other things are moving in there now, and so the makeover of the uh, golf course is complete and has been for a while, but the uh, but all the plantings now look uh, significantly well to uh, invite people there and actually show it off. So you can look forward to that. And since Mr. Bartlett isn't here, I'll uh, give his obligatory uh, invitation to First Thursday tonight, which happens all over downtown this evening, and uh, then toss in a... Uh, Another note that it's also opening night of a three-night run for Santa Barbara High School's Music of the Night. And if you don't know that, that's uh, 20, almost 20 Broadway numbers uh, on stage, musical numbers on stage uh, for two and a half hours with a live orchestra uh, produced and directed by the students themselves. As I say, it's kind of like cliff notes for dummies on Broadway, all in two hours. So you can, if, you, if you're going to first Thursday tonight, you can use one of the next two nights to go to either the film festival or music of the night. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Uh, before we adjourn, uh, we have one last item, and that's the approval of the 2011 uh, primary and alternate liaisons to uh, city boards and commissions. And I'm looking for a motion to uh, affirm the assignments that we um, we continued from last year to this year with some minor exceptions. So move. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. And having done our business for the day, we are adjourned. Thank you very much. Good night.